Um, hi, I'm Pascal from the Sanders National Lab, and I'd like to just like go for a quick introduction for our session. So here we're going to talk about opportunity and challenges in cosmology visualization. So we have like four different sessions. So the first one, we're going to talk about cosmology. Then we're going to talk about mostly ray tracing and applications in cosmology. And then we're going to have like people from Intel and NVIDIA talking about this too. Then we're going to focus on visualization, different work that has been done in visualization. And then finally, we are going to end up with, finish with open space, one of the nice, very nice tools for visualizing the universe and real data in the universe. So without further ado, I think we should start with Catherine's talk on introduction to cosmology and the challenges for visualization. Okay, we can start the first video. Hardware National Lab, and I will talk to you about challenges in computational cosmology and how visualization can help us to understand our simulations in more detail. The first visualization that I want to show you, you see here on the right, is a snapshot at current times of the dark matter distribution in one of our recent very large scale simulations. So you see here on the left upper corner a slice through the full box and then you see a zoom in into different parts of the box ending up with the biggest object in the simulation that we have identified which is so-called cluster um, of galaxies and a um, hundred to a thousand galaxies would live in this matter distribution that you can see here. Modern cosmology is really the story of mapping the sky in multiple wavelengths. The challenge in cosmology is that we can't do experiments like um, we usually do in physics where we go into a laboratory and build the system that we want to study but rather what we have to do is we have to observe our universe in different wavelengths. What you see here on the right are maps of the universe in the x-ray, in the microwave, in the gamma ray and in the optical. From these measurements we are trying to build a coherent picture of the evolution and the content of our universe and um, we want to make sure that our theoretical predictions actually um, agree with what we observe with our big telescopes from the ground and from space. These maps cover measurements of objects, stars and galaxies, as well as fields like temperatures, for example, in this X-ray map here. Maps can be very large. Um, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which you see down here, the optical map, recorded more than 500 million photometric objects, um, upcoming surveys, are going to record billions of objects to study the universe. Then the next step, what we do with these maps in cosmology is actually we statistically analyze these maps. So we count objects, um, we make correlation functions from the objects that we have found, um, we identify um, extreme objects, and um, from that we try to learn about the universe. As you can imagine, simulations play a key role in several ways here. For one, we would like to explore if the theories that we have about our universe um, are actually correct and um, when we compare our simulations to the observations, we can figure that out. We also use our simulations to actually um, do systematic investigations. For example, our telescopes are not perfect. The atmosphere is in between our telescope and um, the galaxies that we observe if we have a ground-based um, observation. And so what we are trying to do is to really use these simulations to understand possible systematics um, that are in our data due to um, observations or us not fully understanding the physics. The aim in the end is to create very accurate synthetic skies across wavelengths um, and these sky maps have to cover very large areas. And therefore the requirement is extreme scale computing so that we can actually record detailed temporal and spatial maps um, with very high resolution of our universe. What have we learned so far in cosmology from these observations and from our theoretical investigations? One thing that we have learned is that the universe is very dark. The two major components that make up the matter energy content of the universe are the so-called dark energy and the dark matter. And together these make up 95% um, of the matter energy content in the universe. Dark energy has been observed in 1998 for the first time and um, the discovery was awarded with a Nobel Prize in 2011 
And um, it basically tells us that the expansion of the universe is accelerated. How can we think about this? Imagine you throw a ball in the air and instead of it coming down, it flies upwards faster and faster. And so this observation has led to um, one of the fa most fascinating puzzles in physics today. We are asking ourselves, um, what is this? Why is this happening right now? If we would have lived like two billion years earlier in the history of the universe, we would not have seen this. Being totally ignorant, what we are trying to do right now is really to characterize um, this phenomena much better with um, better observations and better simulations. And we are trying to exclude some of the possible explanations that um, we have come up with so far. The second component, dark matter, makes up roughly 27% of the matter energy content in the universe. And we call it dark because it does not emit or absorb light. So far, we only have detected dark matter indirectly by um, the way how it bends um, the light, for example. And the aim is, again, just like with dark energy, to characterize the nature of dark matter in more detail. And to detect the actual dark matter particle um, would be uh, a really big breakthrough in physics. And we have, have built many detectors to do this, and um, we are uh, building many more, many bigger detectors in the near future. So on the right here, you see roughly um, how the observer's universe is um, just a very small fraction of the visible matter, and the dark matter and the dark energy is really 95% um, of our universe. And these 0.5% of the matter-energy content that lives in stars is really what tells us a lot about the content and the evolution of the universe. So the second piece to the puzzle in cosmology is the evolution of the universe. And um, so we want to understand how structures form, how did the galaxies come into being that we observe today with our telescope. And here on the right, you see um, a rough picture of the evolution of the universe, starting with the Big Bang. Here is um, the cosmic microwave background that we have observed um, with exquisite details with ground-based and um, space-based um, surveys. And um, from here you can see that um, the evolution of the universe carries on down to uh, um, today where we see um, the galaxies and we can measure their distribution. We have a solid understanding of structure formation and um, we know how to uh, set up initial conditions and they're determined by the primordial fluctuations that we have measured from the cosmic microwave background. These initial perturbations are amplified by, gra by the gravitation instability in a dark matter dominated universe. And um, what happens is that um, clumps of dark matter start forming. These clumps of dark matter, um, gas falls into them, starts heating up, stars start forming. And after the stars form, then galaxies are forming and we are getting close um, to the universe today. We will see a little bit of um, an illustration via a movie later on. We have a good understanding of um, the um, relevant theory. It's gravity, field theory, and atomic physics. And um, the early universe is actually described by linear perturbation theory. And our theoretical understanding is very successful. For the latter half of the history of the universe, nonlinear effects actually dominate. And um, these are impossible to treat without large scale computing. So what we do is we set up our simulations very early on when the physics of structure formation is still linear and um, we can write it down with pencil and paper and the universe is only 50 million years old. From there, we start evolving the simulation up to today where we can then analyze the much more complicated structures that have formed. So how do we set up these simulations? Computing the universe on one slide. Um, basically, gravity dominates on large scales. So what we can do is we can use Monte Carlo sampling of densities with tracer particles. These particles are tracers of the dark matter in the universe, and their mass is typically around 10 to the 9 solar masses. And for the simulation, what is important is that, um, I said at the start, we want to simulate the maps as large as possible, so the volume of the simulation is important, and then the resolution in the simulation, which is given by the number of particles that I can actually um, simulate. So the number of particles for um, modern cosmology simulation is in the trillions. And um, so with this, I can actually simulate a modern survey with this mass resolution on supercomputers today. Here you see the equations of motions that we are solving. 
Um, this is the equation of motion for the chaser particle in the expanding universe. The expansion is given by the scale factor A here. And here you see the ingredients that I talked about before, the matter content, which um, in this case contains the dark matter and the baryons. And here we have the dark energy component that I have described before. So we can put all of this together on a supercomputer. And here you see a cartoonish picture of the structure evolution in the simulation that we run. So here you see at the start, um, the density field is, is um, pretty homogeneous and you see small little spikes already. And gravity acts on these um, over densities here and pulls things together and over time structures form. And here you see how um, the dark matter distribution looks today with these clouds. I always like to show this quote from Bob Dickey from uh, with his lecture in 1969, where he says the universe is far too complicated a structure to be studied deductively, starting from initial conditions and solving the equation of motion. But this is exactly what we do today, and modern supercomputers have made this possible. So just to recap, you want to create your own universe on a supercomputer. What do you need? The constituents. We have a good understanding of that. We put in the dark matter and the dark energy. You need dynamical rules. Here we focus on um, gravity, initial conditions. Those are given to us from our observations from the cosmic microwave background, so we know how to set them up. And you need a very big supercomputer. You obviously also need a good code that scales to this very big supercomputer, and here we are using HACK. Um, HACK stands for hy hybrid, uh, Hardware Hybrid Accelerated Cosmology Code and is actively developed at Argon and the Exascale Computing Project um, is helping us a lot to actually prepare HACK um, for the upcoming Exascale supercomputers, Aurora and Frontier at Argon and at Oak Ridge. So it's very exciting times for us to carry out these very large simulations. Now let's take a very quick look at a movie. So here what you see again, the initial conditions, Z is the time, um, this is very early on, as I said, roughly 50 million years after the Big Bang. And now we see how the structure actually forms. So we zoom in, this is actually just um, a very small portion of the big simulation. So you see how gravity acts on these clumps, how these clumps move towards each other and then start um, forming bigger and bigger structures. We pause here now for a little bit in order to move, move into one of the biggest um, structures forming in this piece of the simulation. So you see that here, the little clumps come together. They are attracted by this very big clump that is forming here already. And um, so these are the structures that we then statistically analyze. We count how many of these clumps we have. We count, we measure their size, we measure their mass. And um, that tells us about the universe. And just another visualization that shows you the formation of just one of these very, very large, um, what we call dark matter halos. So here again, we are very early in time, so everything is relatively smooth. And if we move forward, you can see that the small clumps are actually forming, the small halos, they merge with each other. And then in order to form at the end, this very, very big structure um, that we can then compare to observations. So as I told you before, what we want to do is we want to actually explore the universe and the simulations allow us to do that by <coughs> changing the ingredients and the model assumptions. So what you see here on the left is a standard model of cosmology that I have described to you at the start of this talk. And now we can do different things. We can switch off the dark energy. We can say, well, maybe there is no dark energy. And yet, then you can see how the formation of structure actually changes, how you form all of these many more little clumps. The colors are actually velocities of the particles. Or we can change how the dark matter is um, modeled. We give it a little bit of a temperature use. So you see that the structures are smoothing out. As you can imagine, visualization helps a lot here because you can actually visually see that the simulation does what you expect it to do. And then um, in the next step, you can measure again the number of clumps, their masses, and compare them with each other and with the observations. So far, I have talked only about the dark matter distribution, but um, at the very start, I told you about the galaxy maps that we are map making. And so what we really have to do is connect the dark matter maps um, with the galaxies themselves. So we add another modeling component to this. For example, we are looking at these dark matter clumps. We measure their size, um, their mass. We know then how many galaxies would be in such a clump. We also can measure how old 
a clump is when it's a halo form and from that we can determine what kind of galaxies live in it. And then here on the right you see the observational setup where we measure the distribution of galaxies on the sky and then both come together, we compare the black points with the arrow bars are the observational data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, this red line is the prediction from the dark matter and the blue line is the prediction from our galaxy distribution that we have modeled on top of each other. This is all of course a little bit cartoonish, the whole um, modeling process is much more complex but um, you get the idea of um, how this all works together. Then we can get even more sophisticated with our simulations. Not only do we um, determine where the galaxies live, but we also can generate and simulate images of galaxies. And so here you see where we have taken this step one further. We produced a galaxy um, catalog and then for each galaxy we actually determined its color and um, then simulated images for this. Um, this is actually a simulation of the um, observations that we will carry out with the Vera Rubin Observatory, a telescope currently being built in Chile. And um, we even have the telescope itself in these simulations. So um, if something is more fuzzy, it's um, because the telescope resolution is um, restricted. So you can do a lot and as you can see again, visualization plays an important role because um, just looking at these things helps you to understand if what you're doing is actually correct. So that was my quick introduction to cosmology, computational cosmology in particular. And um, I just want to end with a set of challenges that we are actually facing. So I've talked mostly about large scale structure gravity only simulation during this talk but we are also doing hydrodynamic simulations. Our gravity simulations are um, done with HACK currently. HACK has been under development for more than 10 years now. It works well on all currently available platforms. We have started developing um, a new code version that also introduces baryons. It's called CRK HACK. And here verification and validation of our modeling approaches is very, very important and a big challenge and visualization is very um, helpful in this. I have shown you that tracking structure over time at high temporal and spatial resolution is very important. This is obviously very challenging because our simulations can produce petabytes of data. So in situ analysis is one way um, that, that we can achieve these um, the tracking of the structures um, at the resolution that we want. And finally the galaxy modeling piece um, I alluded to at the end of my talk and here the work is done in post-processing after structure formation process has been captured in great detail and it involves complex workflows to um, really make galaxy catalogs um, that look realistic and um, can be used to then analyze upcoming, uh, upcoming observations and draw more conclusions about cosmology. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Heitman, for the talk. Uh, I'm Jesus Polito, I'm the chair for this session. And uh, there is a question uh, in the chat about uh, this talk. Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, what is the numerical resolution of the simulation mass and length? And what kind of feedback from stars and black holes do you have in the model? Very good question, thanks very much. Um, so 
the simulations that I showed in this talk are gravity only simulations. So we don't have the stars and um, black hole feedback Hi. in there. Um, what we want to do with these simulations is to cover the uh, surveys that we are investigating, like the um, so in digital sky survey that I showed or the um, LSST with the Rubin Observatory. So the length scale that we want to cover is um, in the gigaparsecs. Um, so a parsec is, um, it's, it's, it's the survey scale that we want to cover. The resolution that we have is um, one time 10 to the six. So it's in the kiloparsec um, scale. That is the spatial resolution. And the mass resolution in these simulations is around 10 to the eight to 10 to the nine solar masses. Other simulations have much higher resolution, but they are then not focused so much on the cosmology, but more on the astrophysics of the galaxy formation. So, so there's a whole range of simulations, but what I was talking about is in this range. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So I think that'll wrap up this first session. Uh, we'll move on to the next one about uh, ray tracing. Uh, so to start it out, we're going to have uh, Hannah Ross start off her talk uh, titled Reionizing Re uh, of the Universe. Hi, my name is Hannah Ross and I'm a postdoc in Lawrence Berkeley National Lab working with Zaria Lukic. And I'm going to be talking about ray tracing in cosmological simulations, more specifically ray tracing in the epoch of reionization. So what is reionization? When the universe began, it was extremely small and hot, and this meant that all of the uh, gas was ionized. As the universe expanded, the temperature dropped, and this meant that the atoms could, fo could, could form, and the universe became neutral. Once the universe was neutral, stars formed, and these stars emitted ionizing radiation, which reionized the universe, and this process is called reionization. So this is a nice diagram of reionization. So on the left-hand side is the beginning of time, and on the right-hand side is kind of where we are now. And it, during the, so in the beginning it was, you can see that the Dark Ages is kind of like when everything's neutral and nothing's really happening. And then about 400 million years into the universe's lifetime, stars formed, and this is when reionization starts. And then it's ionized by like about, say, here. This um, epoch hasn't actually been seen yet, because it's so, it's so distant. Um, and But one of the ways which we hope that we'll be able to see it is through the 21 centimeter transition. So the 21 centimeter transition is caused by um, the hyper, uh, hyperfine transition in hydrogen. So hydrogen makes up almost all of the gas in the universe, especially at early times. And hydrogen is made of a proton and an electron, and these, the proton and the electron can either spin in the same direction or in anti-parallel directions. When they're spinning in the same direction, they have slightly more energy than when they're spinning in anti-parallel directions. And very rarely, this at the, an atom can go from par parallel spins to anti-parallel spins, and this results in a photon of 21 centimeters being released. This is very rare, and this happens does not happen very often, which makes it a perfect probe for cosmic structure because cosmic structure evolves really, really, really slowly. So if if the lifetime was was any quicker, it would all of the the atoms would end up in the lower energy state and we'd only see the very beginning of, of, of the like, structure. This is another an example of another application of the 21 centimeter signal in astrophysics. So this is a very nearby galaxy and called the Pinwheel, Pinwheel Galaxy. And the, the image on the left is in the optical range. This is kind of like what you'd see if you just look through a telescope. And the image on the right is the image from the 21 centimeter photons. So you can see you can get like quite a little bit extra information from this. You can see that the stars are forming in pockets of neutral gas and it just kind of shows the um, the power of this observe of this tool. So um, and this would be in the early universe almost everything's made of hydrogen. So you'd get to see you get an incredibly detailed map of the neutral hydrogen and there'd be holes where the stars have ionized areas. So although there hasn't been a measurement yet, there have there are many um, telescopes that are trying to make this measurement. And here's a nice list of them. So the low frequency array, LOFA, which is on the bottom left, has made has put some upper limits on the signal. And the edges, which is the experiment to detect the global sig 
global EOR signature has claimed a detection. However, this detection has been um, can't be explained with current physics. So either we completely don't understand what's going on at this time in the universe, or something is wrong with their observation. So you know, it depends on who you talk to. But there definitely needs to be a um, a bit more work on this before it's believed by the community. So in in the future, there's a telescope called SKA which will be built. And it's going to be the world's largest radio telescope. It has um, it's going to have a square kilometer array of collecting area, and the maximum baseline is going to be 65 kilometers, and it's going to have many many antennas. And the great thing about this is it's going to be sensitive, much more sensitive than the previous telescopes, and hopefully we'll make a detection. Another observable which could be used to see the um, to kind of constrain realization is the Lyman Alpha Forest. I'm not going to get too much into that. I'm just going to say that um, it also depends on reionization because of large scale temperature fluctuations which are introduced by reionization itself. And um, it's a, another big area of interest in astrophysics. So, why, why, why do we want to see the epoch of reionization? Well, the main reason is it's never been seen before, and we don't really understand much about that time, so we don't really know how these high redshift galaxies behave and it would be really interesting to, to know more about that. Also, if we once we get images of the 21 centimeter signal, and also from the Lyman Alpha Forest, um, it's gonna, those images are gonna be very sensitive to um, the astrophysics driving the, um, the epoch of realization and also to the type of dark matter that's present. So this is a big question in astrophysics, what, what kind of dark matter is there? And um, so simulating the epoch of realization could help us to sort of and to understand these observations and maybe put constraints on, on the cosmology and contents of the universe and also the astrophysics that goes on at these early times. So this is a kind of sim simplified version of what um, the e how the epoch of reionization progresses. So you can see that like stars form and then the and then an ionized region kind of forms around them and the longer they've been around the larger the ionized region is. However, it's not really this simple in real life because the density of the universe is not homogeneous. So the ionization front travels at different speeds depending on the density of the gas. So if you have a very dense region, the ionization takes it takes a lot longer for the star to ionize it because there's many more atoms in that area. But if you have a, a, low, a low density region, then the ionization front can go through really fast. So you don't have spheres forming around the stars. You have kind of like this very interesting complicated pattern which kind of grows and spreads through the whole universe. And this is of course in 3D, this is just 2D slices from a 3D simulation from a group in England that I worked with during my PhD. And so simulating realization is computationally very challenging because it's a multi-scale problem and this means that um, basically you need to take into account astrophysical processes which are happening on very small scales, well small for astrophysics, so like a few kiloparsecs so you have to kind of resolve what's happening in galaxies, which means the simulation needs to have a high resolution. At the same time, you need to be able to, you know, the simulation has to be big enough to contain these huge ionized bubbles and to capture the patchiness of the process. And this requires 100 megaparsec scales. So the, you need to have a very high resolution simulation with a very big block size, which makes it expensive. So the way that we've been doing this so far is with a called C C2 ray, and it's a short characteristic ray tracing method which explicitly so conserves photons, which you would think they all would, but they don't. And it's been tested in co comparison projects, which is the best way to verify this kind of thing because there's no analytical solution really. So the best thing is to get several different methods and just check that they're all doing the same thing. And it's done pretty well against other codes. So this is the, the algorithm how C2 ray works. So First of all, you have to calculate, so you have, for every source, you have to solve something called the chemistry equations, which I'll talk about in a second, um, which basically means you have to calculate the heating rates in the cell from the source. And the heating rate will depend on the density of the cell and also the flux. And this is very difficult because as more photons, as the cell becomes more ionized, the density changes, which then changes the ionization rate. So there are a few tricks that that we use to, to make this uh, by using the time optical average 
time average optical depth to do this calculation. But essentially, it has to be solved iteratively, which makes it a little difficult. And then once that's done, you advance to the next cell. And these cells have to be done in order, because in order of the distance from the source, because the amount, the, cell, the first cell has the total flux from the star, and then the next cell has whatever flux has gotten through the previous cell. So you have to go through, and then it has to also be done in, in each of the eight directions coming out of the, of the source, for every source. So this is the equation that has to be solved. This is the chemistry equations for hydrogen, and the universe is almost completely made up of hydrogen, so we just don't really consider the other elements. I mean, maybe in the future, but not now. So x is the ionized fraction. So the f x, um, so the, no the number of the, f the fraction of photons which are of atoms which ionize and the fraction of atoms which are equal. And the gamma is the ionization rate. Kappa is the collisional ionization rate. So um, the, the number of atoms which ionize just crashing into each other. And alpha is the recombination rate. So sometimes electrons and photons and uh, protons recombine. So the, the collisional ionization rate and the recombination rate are fairly straightforward because they just depend on the density. However, the photoionization rate is more difficult. But this is the part which which depends, so it depends on the density on both sides. So the ionization rate depends on, sorry, it depends on the, on the ionization rate on both sides, on the number of hydrogens. So the ionization rate is how many photons are going through the cell, but then, and it depends on the number of hydrogens, but as time goes by, the number of hydrogens goes down because the, there's photoionization happening. So this is the part that has to be solved iteratively. And then, as there are many sources, you can have, so there are many cells which are being influenced by both sources, and it could be the case that, and the ordering may matter. So the rates, so all of the rates that have been calculated are applied simultaneously. But this, we need to check that it doesn't really, the ordering of, of this doesn't matter. So what C2Ray does is it does one sweep through the whole box, like it calculates all of the photoionization rates in for some random order, and then it does it again for a different random order. And then it checks that those two results aren't too different, and if they're not, it will move on to the next step. Um, if they are different, then it will do it again, and it will keep going around and around until it does have convergence. This again makes it expensive. Okay, so at LBL we have the hyd hydrogen gravity code NIX, and we would like to add radio transfer to correctly model ionization, both to look at the 21 centimeter and to look at the lemon alpha forest. However, this is um, it's very expensive, and we would like to find the most efficient way to do this, and then compare it to C to Ray and check that everything is working. Thank you very much for listening. Hi, my name is Aaron Noll <clears throat> from Intel Corporation, and I'm here today to talk about the One API rendering toolkit and how we've used it in uh, cosmology visualization as part of this application spotlight in cosmology um, for IEEE Visiweek 2020. I'll briefly introduce the Intel One API rendering toolkit, or as we call it, the render kit which is Intel's open source software suite for advanced rendering and visualization, especially helping with high performance computing visualization and professional viz needs. It consists of uh, Intel Embry, which is a um, low level kernel library for, um, effect for efficient um, BVH building, traversal, and primitive intersection. The uh, open volume kernel library, uh, which is designed for um, volume structure abstraction 
and effective uh, sampling and filtering of volumes uh, and traversal as well. Uh, Osprey, which is the high-level render graph API, which ties the lower lower level pieces um, of, um, uh, of the render kit together and exposes them to software such as Paraview and Visit through this API. Um, and then we have software, for example, Open Image Denoise, which is a denoiser for path traced images, Open Swir, which is a fast um, software rasterizer, and Osprey Studio, which is a, um, a highest level front end that we use for professional visualization and, um, and, quick, and, and, and quick demos and proofs of concept. Um, and together, these are, these are the render kit. The render kit software stack looks more or less like this. At the very top of the stack, you'd have an end user application, for example, Paraview or Visit, um, or possibly Osprey Studio. Um, you'd, at the middle level of the stack, you have Osprey and uh, family products, for example, Osprey MPI, um, that expose the interface. And then at the low level of the stack, you'd have the component libraries, for example, um, Embry, OpenBKL, OpenImage Denoise. And at the bottom, you have the hardware, um, for example, Intel Xeon or core CPU architectures or the upcoming Intel Xe GPU architectures. Now to discuss cosmology viz. Um, we, when we've seen um, cosmology visualization problems in the past, we've noticed that they tend to be different from a lot of other viz um, in some ways. Um, so first of all, they tend to have a lot of multi-physics and multi-structure um, data. So for example, in one uh, cosmology uh, simulation, you can have structure data alongside particle data. You can have adaptive mesh refinement data alongside both of them. Um, so there's not really a one-size-fits-all um, type of data that you want to render. Uh, simulations can be very large. They can be in the order of trillions of particles for some of the hack capability runs that uh, we're currently looking at. Uh, and you can have 10k cubed to 16k cubed structured volumes uh, in the case of the flash data that we visualize in, uh, later on. Um, and right there you get into uh, terabytes per time step and potentially petabytes or exabytes across an entire simulation run. Very rarely are these data uh, saved out to disk in their, entire, in, in their entirety. So you really are working with in situ methods and better batch techniques. Um, so um, because of, partly because of this, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on data triage and reduction techniques and really trying to focus in on what you're looking at inside the simulation. So there are techniques, for example, halo finding um, in, in uh, large scale cosmology visualization. And there are also other um, conversion techniques, uh, data reduction techniques like converting to structure data via an SPH filter. Um, and as a result of that, there's not really always a right visualization modality or a single right visualization mod modality that you want to use for cosmology viz. Um, and in this talk, I'm focusing more on the general rendering problems as opposed to the more tricky question of how uh, do you correctly visualize um, large-scale cosmology data. Um, but there isn't really a one-size-fits-all uh, solution for this. Uh, in general, in this talk, we'll talk we'll mostly cover volume rendering, uh, and for this, I'll, I'll um, briefly talk about the Intel Open Volume Kernel Library, or OpenVKL. OpenVKL is a set of scalar and vector kernels for sampling and traversing volume data, and really, what it does most is abstract volume structure. Uh, so we can have one API that covers uh, structured, unstructured, AMR, or particle data, or other types of volume data. And then you have a set of interfaces, a sampler, iterator, observer, and filter interfaces that um, let you um, work on the, operate on these volume data sets regardless of their underlying structure. Um, recently, we added particle volumes as a capability. I'll talk about that very briefly. And there's ongoing ISPC on XPU development in OpenVKL. The other piece of software that is most relevant to cosmology visualization is Osprey, which is the high-level render graph API for scientific and professional visualization. Um, I won't talk too much about Osprey itself and the Osprey API, um, but I will mention um, the, the family products, Osprey MPI and VTK Osprey. Osprey MPI um, allows Osprey objects to be specified in an MPI cluster environment. 
And then you can render um, it either in replicated mode with replicated data, and there you can use full path tracing techniques, or you can use um, uh, ray casting or partial ambient occlusion techniques to render distributed data. And that second one is what we're especially interested in when you're uh, talking about uh, terascale um, per time step um, volume data coming out of cosmology simulation, for example, what we've, we've done with Flash. Um, I'll also mention VTK Osprey, which exposes Osprey into uh, VTK and is used uh, in the Osprey integrations in both ParaView and Visit. This is open source, developed in partnership with Kitware, and it's upstream, upstreamed into VTK uh, directly. Uh, we're also uh, using this as the basis for the um, Cronus Inari specification, which would be a cross-vendor uh, way of, uh, of tying lower-level ray tracers into, um, into ParaView and Visit. And there's more information on that on the Cronus Inari website. Um, the most recent piece of work that uh, we've done uh, directly for cosmology is particle volumes in OpenVKL 0.10. Um, and this is an ongoing collaboration with folks at Argonne National Laboratory and Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, particle volumes are um, a three-dimensional RBF radial basis function, or also known as a smooth particle hydrodynamics, or SPH model. Um, and they're really a scalar field that's defined as the sum of Gaussians, as you can see. Um, this is implemented in OpenVKL using Embry BVH builders and then uh, traversed in a custom traversal inside OpenVKL. Uh, and what's great about this is that it supports volume path tracing uh, using the full OpenVKL API. So it's like any other volume that you'd have in OpenVKL. Um, and here we have an image um, of relatively small, roughly 6 million particle of dark sky hack data. Uh, that's volume path traced in OpenVKL. Work that we've done several years ago and um, we've continued to maintain and improve um, in, in OpenVKL is, um, and Osprey is uh, AMR rendering, adaptive mesh refinement rendering. Uh, in particular, uh, block-structured AMR, namely GR Chombo. This is a collaboration we've had with Paul Shellard at the Stephen Hawking Center for Theoretical Cosmology at Cambridge, and Carson Brownlee at Intel, is, in particular, has done a lot of work both on the implementation and the production side to really see it come to light. It's based on a paper that we, um, we had at SIGGRAPH Asia um, in uh, 2017 the uh, SIGGRAPH Asia Symposium on Visualization. It was originally implemented in Osprey 1, and now it's fully exposed in um, OpenVKL and Osprey 2. So the video on the right, the boson star formation, uh, actually leverages path tracing in OpenVKL. And the last application I'll focus on is distributed volume rendering with Osprey MPI. Um, Osprey MPI, as you remember, is a full Osprey device implementation um, for MPI in a cluster. And when you use Osprey MPI, you can either have data that are uh, distributed, so you have different data on each node, or replicated. And when we're looking at terascale cosmology data, for example, this four terabyte flash data set, um, you definitely want to use distributed data rendering. And this um, is based on two recent papers um, in uh, Eurovis 2019 and a recent book chapter in the In-Situ Visualization for Computational Science um, uh, series um, uh, that describes the algorithms that, that implement this. Um, the demo you see on the right is a 4 terabyte um, 10k cubed flash data set which was rendering interactively on 27 nodes of Frontera at, at TAC. Um, in, uh, interestingly, this rendered uh, roughly 140 times faster than an equivalent in visit, and that's just purely because of the, the fewer nodes we're using, the larger memory per node footprint that we're able to take advantage of, and the efficiency of Osprey MPI.
And that concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Peter Mesmer and I'm going to talk to you about technology for cosmology visualizations at NVIDIA. As you can imagine, we have a broad range of rendering and visualization technologies at NVIDIA, but our goal is to make them accessible to all the scientists by putting those technologies directly into the typically used visualization tools. So for instance, over the past few years, we've developed um, a ray tracing backend for Paraview based on our optics uh, ray tracing framework. Or we developed a, um, a tool or a plugin for Paraview for using the index volume rendering engine as a plugin. Now, the, the fact that we're using Paraview is mostly a practical one. So if you have um, a specific tool that you think could use some advanced rendering technologies, please get in touch with us and we try to figure out how to best incorporate this into your, um, into your tool of choice. Now, one of the exciting developments that happened um, within the index volume renderer is that um, we've introduced point cloud support. So, um, this allows you to have just arbitrary point sets and leverage multi-GPU, multi-node systems for efficient rendering of uh, point clouds on GPUs. In addition to uh, taking advantage of multi-GPUs and multi-nodes, um, we can also leverage uh, the RT cores, so our ray tracing cores that were introduced in the Turing architecture and have just been announced to be available on Ampere as well. So um, uh, one of the benefits there is that uh, when you go, for instance, from a V100 GPU built on the Volta architecture to an RTX 8000 GPU built on the Turing architecture, we see about a 2x speed up for these point cloud renderings, despite the fact that the RTX 8000 has only about 70% of the total bandwidth. And so as a consequence, you can um, get to uh, real-time frame rates within, let's say, 10 to frame, 20 frames per second for data sets uh, well exceeding um, 10 million par particles. The um, point cloud rendering engine is not yet released, but uh, its release is imminent. Now, and another um, data structure that's relevant for cosmology visualization are sparse volumes. And especially on GPUs, sparse volumes can be a bit tricky to um, efficiently represent. Now, again, we just released recently um, a nano VDB, which is a um, sparse volume representation built on the Open VDB standard. Open VDB is an award-winning industry standard for uh, storing and manipulating sparse dynamic volumes. It's often used uh, within the visual effects um, softwares, for instance, for simulating particles. And so uh, popular packages like Houdini um, have support uh, natively for OpenVDB data structures. Uh, but it's not only limited to, to Houdini, there is also um, open source tools like PyOpenVDB for Python support. And uh, people have tried to use Houdini and OpenVDB with the uh, YTNE effort in the cosmology context. And so it's exciting to see uh, the nano VDB support, which um, allows now to um, efficiently use VDB data structures on GPUs, um, especially for, for visualization and for rendering. So I'd like to point you to the, um, to the URL below uh, where we have a, a recent blog post on that topic. Now, another challenge that was brought up by the organizers is that um, 
for cosmology visualizations, you need to have support for uh, workflows and um, for coupling of different services together. And so um, I just wanted to draw your attention to Omniverse, which is our open 3D collaboration platform that uh, originally was built for the media and entertainment space, but has increasingly an, um, an applicability within the scientific computing context as well. You can think of, open, of Omniverse as something like a database that um, orchestrates um, different clients that uh, can provide or consume um, assets for uh, visualization. And so, again, if you think in terms of the media and entertainment space, those clients would be, for instance, Maya or Houdini or Unreal. Um, and or it could also be our own high end ray tracing render called uh, uh, Omniverse Kit. Now, in the scientific computing space, we've added more clients. Um, in this particular case, VTK and, and Paraview that allow to interact with these other tools. And so um, this hub, this centralized hub for uh, exchange of information um, can act as a, as a melting pot between um, assets that were created in, in Paraview and are being augmented with uh, tools like Maya to, to then uh, being rendered within Houdini, for instance. And so Omniverse allows this um, very dynamic and very flexible um, interplay between different components and different tools. And so one uh, possible scenario would be that you're coupling um, a cosmology simulation that runs on an HPC system and is instrumented with Catalyst. Um, you're coupling this to Omniverse and you're consuming those assets with our uh, RTX ray tracing renderer. That would be like the, the simplest workflow via Omniverse. But in addition, you could also have artists that um, work on these assets and um, I don't know, select subsets of the points um, for special highlighting. Or you could have uh, separate services running on these data sets, uh, performing halo finding operations or perform some binning of the particles, uh, particle data to, to uh, volumetric data or any other types of, um, of services that can be run continuously on, on this large scale data set. Then finally, on the, um, on the user side, you could um, have just planar renderings, you could have uh, VR renderings, or we can uh, stream uh, the results also into Jupyter Notebooks. And so Omniverse enables um, a discoupling of the uh, multiple components together and um, therefore allows to build complex systems comprised of, um, of this broad range of services. Um, we've built a variety of, of pipelines like this uh, based on Omniverse, but uh, so far nothing in the cosmology space. And so we'd be very interested in uh, collaborating with uh, some of you um, to explore this um, exciting technology for the cosmology visual visualization space. Now, another point that was brought up by the organizers is that, um, for instance, for the reionization challenge, which is very close to uh, volume, and, uh, volume rendering, um, we're facing the problem that there's a variety of um, vendor specific uh, technologies that have emerged over the past few years that support ray tracing or volume rendering. But it's hard for a domain scientist to come up with a um, a solution that can leverage all these different technology components in a transparent way. And so I just wanted to draw your attention to the um, ongoing ANARI um, effort, which is a Kronos working group that uh, was started about half a year ago. And the goal of ANARI is to address um, a problem that's very close to that. Uh, so the idea is that, um, especially with ray tracing, um, it becomes increasingly difficult to build um, rendering engines that can leverage all the hardware components that are available in modern um, accelerators from different, uh, from different vendors. And so what Anari offers is 
a mechanism to separate the different concerns. So the application developer only needs to, to worry about uh, setting up what needs to be rendered and the, um, the vendors will provide backends for their specific platform to leverage whatever technology they have available to turn these specifications into a, um, um, a rendering. Now, so far, the, the focus has been mostly on converting a um, geometry specifications or volumetric specification into pixels. But um, it would be interesting to see um, what kind of extensions are necessary to enable more flexible or more uh, complex um, type of operations as well. For instance, uh, going towards um, these type of, of reionization problems. Where are we at the moment? Uh, so Anari, as I said, has only started about half a year ago, but um, there has been already quite a bit of, of progress. Uh, and we have now various applications um, that, can, that are built on top of these early drafts of Anari. And we have a, a range of backends that can take the, um, the Anari, um, that can take a specification that was, or a geometry that was built on top of Anari and convert this into pixels. And so we have some of you already participating in this ongoing development um, effort, um, but um, anyone is welcome to join and we're definitely interested in uh, hearing about the use cases that go beyond uh, rendering, despite the fact that this is not yet the, uh, the top priority. So the first step is to make sure that we get from, um, from geometry specifications into, uh, uh, into pixels and then as a second step, we can uh, think about extending this to more um, to, to broader uh, types of applications. So just to um, to summarize what uh, what I talked about, um, basically we have a, a range of technologies uh, to address the visualization challenges in cosmology. So that starts with uh, support for point cloud rendering and volume rendering in NVIDIA Index. Uh, we have integration of those uh, technologies, including uh, ray tracing into Paraview, VTK, and possibly into other um, uh, visualization tools. And um, I haven't talked about this, but we also have support for accelerating IO uh, with GPU Direct, so that if you have large data sets that need to be moved between the file system and your GPUs, you can do that without uh, going via the CPU. On top of that, we have core technologies like uh, OpenVDB or NanoVDB for sparse volume support that could be of interest to the cosmology, uh, cosmology community. And we have uh, a mechanism to couple different tools together uh, and to define frameworks via, and, and to define um, workflows via the, um, the Omniverse framework. And finally, we have an ongoing um, community effort um, with Anari to define a industry standard for um, portable rendering, leveraging ray tracing APIs um, or other hardware um, features. And um, Anari has the potential to be extended to non-graphics operations, but um, I have to uh, put here an asterisk and say, um, the first goal at the moment is to, to support just rendering across all the different um, uh, platforms that we have. But in, a, in any case, we're interested in collaborations, and so please reach out if you want to discuss these technologies in more detail. Thank you very much for your attention, and um, goodbye.
Okay, so for this session, we have a question from, we have two questions. The first question is from Alex, uh, which I think is addressed to Hannah. Uh, it says as follows, how many point sources do you have in the model? Do you organize them into trees at low at larger distances? Do you have reality transfer live parallel with hydro or post-processing? So Hannah is not uh, here today. She could not join us. But for the first question, how many point sources do you have in the model? So I've worked with Hannah for some of these things. So the number of point sources that she can have in the model is like quite big. She can have like probably any number of sources. And for the second question, do you organize them into trees at larger distances? Unfortunately, I do not know the answer to that. And for the third question, do you have do you run radiative transfer parallel with hydro or in post-processing? Currently, what Hannah does is she's running this software, C2Ray, and this is done in uh, post-processing and she's not doing it live. But I feel that she would be happy if this could run with Nix, the code that she is working with. So I don't know if Katrin, who is also a cosmologist, has some more things to add to this. No, not really. <laughs> okay. So then there's a second question from Joe of uh, Chula Cosmos Sims as visualized here, interactive in real time for exploratory analysis. So I think this is a question for Peter Mesmer. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the simulations themselves are not interactive, but the visualizations are. So um, what's shown here was a static um, uh, a time set or a, a, a data set static that was um, interactively visualized. I hope this answers the question. Okay, so I think we are running slightly behind schedule for this. So we'll proceed on to with the next uh, session. So the next session is about visualization and there are two talks comprising of Eulerian and Lagrangian code uh, by Jesus. And then there will be another one, Exascale Visualization Technique and Challenges by uh, Joe. So we are going to start the next session now. I'm Jesus Polito. Uh, I'm a staff scientist at the Los Angeles National Laboratory. And today I'm going to give a talk on using visualization to compare Eulerian and Lagrangian codes. So currently, uh, Exasky ECP consists of two leading cosmology simulation codes, uh, Hack and Nix. And there's an ongoing effort to perform cross validation between these two codes, uh, both statistically and visually. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to go over how visualization plays an important role and some of the inherent challenges when comparing these two fundamentally different codes. So uh, HACK is the Hardware Hybrid Accelerated Cosmology Code. Uh, it's a particle-based uh, framework for computational cosmology. And uh, NIX, based on uh, Amorex, is an adaptive mesh hydrodynamic simulation code uh, based on Euler coordinates. And like I mentioned previously, we're comparing essentially a Eulerian versus a Lagrangian code. So what does it mean to, to be a Eulerian versus Lag Lagrangian code? So a Lagrangian point of view uh, is a way of simulating the point of view of an individual particle through space and time, while a Eulerian point of view is a way of simulating a location or region uh, in space in which time passes. So that's sort of the fundamental difference between these two uh, simulation codes. So the big question is how do we compare these two different codes that produce different types of data sets, uh, essentially a, a particle data set versus an AMR grid data set. So uh, for this cosmology comparison framework, uh, we create a workflow uh, with, with, with both general and comparative visualization techniques. So uh, a few visualization codes, uh, visualization goals, we want to uh, generate general visualization for exploration uh, second, uh, we would like to extract the most massive halo regions to, and, and visualize them. We would like to, to, to visualize and compare the evolution of, of halos and, and how they form. And we'd also like to use a more domain-specific approach and compute and compare their phase diagrams. So in order to do this, both data sets must be in a similar format. Either we convert the hack particle onto a grid to compare a grid versus grid data set to, to simplify the analysis, 
or we could take a Nix grid and convert it into particles to then do particle versus particle. Uh, so with our discussions with the domain researchers, uh, we decided on actually doing hack particles to grids. Uh, one of the reasons being that uh, because hack produces particles, by nature, they are more accurate in representing uh, certain uh, distributions and uh, informations versus just grids. So it would be a fair uh, a comparison to do grid versus grid after we have sample the particles onto a grid. Uh, so some of the tools that we use to do this, so we create a VTK driven conversion workflow to, to do this particle to grid conversion. Uh, we use uh, Cinema to, to simply uh, do quick comparisons between uh, different uh, face diagrams and visualizations. And to have a more interactive approach, we use ParaView uh, to, to compare these different halo regions. So uh, uh, as an input to this visualization workflow, we have a, a, a Nix AMR grid, uh, a set of hacked particles, and uh, these uh, input files called halo properties. So these halo properties are pre-computed halos uh, done at the final time step of the simulation. Uh, so within these halos, we sort them by their density and use their final positions for the purpose of tracking the evolution as we go actually backwards in time. And I'll give an example of that uh, later. Uh, uh, so uh, a sample of, of an example of sampling an index AMR grid onto a regular grid based on its final resolution, for example, uh, if if an index simulation begins at 256 cubed and there are uh, AMR routines as the simulation progresses, the finest grid can evolve to uh, further to 512 cubed up to 1024 cubed. So in this example, we sample uh, the original AMR data set up to 1024 cubed. Therefore, when we sample the hack particles onto a grid, we sample them onto that same 1024 cubed uh, grid. So we currently have uh, support for two different interpolation methods. So it's SPH and NGP. Uh, so currently SPH is used, but we also have the option of, of using NGP for interpolation. And, and like I highlighted before, there, there are three visualization goals and I've highlighted them in, in red. Uh, we want to create a, just a, a general visualization of both data sets. Uh, once we've extracted the top 10 most massive halos and their respective uh, halo regions, we'd like to visualize these halo regions and also compute the face diagrams for these halo regions and for the global data set. So uh, for, for general visualization for exploration, uh, once we performed a log visualization of the data, we actually found uh, these visual artifacts seen on the right. Uh, so. Uh, these these existed within the temperature field, but weren't uh, exhibited in the density fields. Uh, so perhaps these artifacts uh, consisted of, a, of of some small numerical noise. Uh, for some reason, they must have been within statistical margin of error because they weren't picked up. They weren't picked up by traditional uh, statistic methods, uh, and 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 it wasn't actually known until we performed this sort of sanity check, just general visualization, uh, for verification. And it turns out that these errors were related to the code uh, and how the AMR regions were fined specific to temperature. And subsequently, uh, this error was fixed uh, pretty quickly uh, by the Nix uh, developers. And the left image shows uh, an, an, a zoomed in uh, halo region showing this, this fix implemented. So uh, here we have a halo region visualization. And here's an, an example of, of halo comparative viz. Uh, we're actually comparing the different uh, halo regions. Uh, in, in this case, the, the topmost massive halo for both Hack and Nix. And uh, to add to the mix, we're also uh, showing how AMR on the Nix side affects the evolution of halos. Uh, so we want to show the, the creation of these regions and structures. And, and, and we want to come up with with the number of AMR levels needed to be able to match, say, the 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 the, the structure of of hack versus Nix. So we would like to know at, at, up to which point in, in AMR do we reach parity, and to see whether if whether or not the models keep up as we go even beyond these three different levels of AMR. So uh, phase diagrams uh, are a way to map the behavior of a simulation and different regions within a cosmology simulation. So uh, they are a log density versus a log temperature 2D histogram, essentially. 
there are one of the existing methods used for validation, and we've integrated that into our workflow to also compute this. Um, so we could take this method uh, and apply it to different halos and, and halo regions to map the, the progress of the formations. And for this example, we have sort of a, a global computation of this metric for on the left hack and on the right Nix. So uh, the left is hack, it's a particle-based code, so it's a lot more coarse versus Nix. It's actually smoother. Uh, it's actually over smoothing some of the regions is, is what, what they had found. Um, and like I said, we can compute these for the halo regions and, and track this specific metric uh, for, in this case, one of the top halos, the, one of the top dense halos for Redshift 5, 4, and 3. And we could see actually how uh, nearing the end of the Redshift, uh, the, the behavior within the halo sort of mimics a bit of, of what the entire simulation looks like. So for tools, uh, I mentioned before we use Cinema. So Cinema is a tool that provides both a standard uh, and a mechanism that gives domain scientists a quick and easy way to sift through through the results. As you can imagine, we produce many phase diagrams and many uh, visualizations for multiple levels of AMR for multiple time steps for, for two simulations. So uh, this is a lot, uh, a much more simpler uh, interface and it's a lot intimidating or a lot less intimidating, sorry, compared to something like the full pair of UI, which which that also has an important role, which I'll, I'll cover next. Uh, so this allows us to, to quickly compare these phase diagrams of the top 10 halos. Uh, and in the, the five time steps provided by the simulation, and here's an example of, of sliding through the different, uh, the, the sliders provided by, by Cinema. Um, and eventually uh, we could also add both uh, a side-by-side -side of, of Nix versus Hack for the phase diagrams, but uh, for this specific example, uh, it, it wasn't included. So there's the five time steps and the 10 halos. So continuing on tools, uh, after our workflow it generates a unified set of data products. In this case, we have two sets of regular grids. Uh, we use a state file and a script to launch pair view and perform this uh, link view uh, comparison aspect of, of the workflow. So I'll switch over to pair view now and give a quick example of, of what this allows us to do. So at the top, we have our volume visualization on the left hack, on the right Nix, and we're able to interactively go through the data and, and do uh, a typ typical pair view export of viz. And one of the interesting components of this is on the bottom, if you recognize this pattern, we're actually computing the phase diagrams within pair view. So this is extremely helpful because we can link both the phase diagrams at the bottom with the visualizations up top. Uh, Along with this, we could also bring in the temporal aspect of, of the analysis. So we could go backwards in time for this specific halo region and see how both the visualization evolves and how the phase diagram evolves. So let's go back to the last time step and show one of the capabilities provided by Paraview. So like I mentioned before, we have these phase diagrams linked with the visualizations. So say, for example, we'd like to visualize uh, this. We'd like to look at what these high density, high temperature particles correspond to. So we could go ahead and highlight them at the bottom. And they are correlated to the visualization up top in, in, in the 3D volume visualization. And in this case, we could see this is the, uh, the high uh, core density region of the halo, so high temperature, uh, high density, and it correctly maps to the center of, of the halo as expected. And we could also go ahead and do the same for the left side. Uh, so we could go ahead and, and select, we could do a, a bit of uh, interactive uh, adjustment to face diagrams, we could select different regions as you can imagine. And, and this provides a, a, a very uh, great tool to do this interactive uh, explorative uh, visualization uh, aspect where we could select and correlate these different regions within these phase diagrams and map them to the visualization itself.
So uh, finally, our comparison goals, we'd eventually want to reach a convergence point between hack and X, where one agrees with the other within some margin of error. And, and what does this mean? So this means that uh, given a simpler or a similar initial condition parameter input for, for both simulations, we'd like to eventually reach a similar output. Uh, so uh, the, the models uh, being used for both simulations are currently being, are, are even today, constantly being improved and iterated upon. And, and this leads to more open problems and ongoing challenges in which this framework becomes very useful. Uh, for example, uh, finer levels of AMR. So how, if we if we were to produce more than just three levels of AMR, say five levels or 10 levels, how would that affect the halo formation? Uh, and, and how would that affect the halos and, and, and the, the temporal tracking and, and their evolution? And of course, there's also uh, larger data. So as you introduce larger data and uh, bigger problem sets, how does that affect the evolution of, of halos and halo regions? So I hope you enjoyed my talk and uh, thank you for listening. Hi, uh, I'm Joe Kinsley from Argonne National Laboratory, uh, where I'm the team lead for data analysis and visualization for the patient computing facility. Uh, I'm also an associate research professor at Northern Illinois University. And I'm going to talk about exascale visualization, uh, some of the challenges and techniques. Uh, this, of course, will be in the context of pathology visualization, uh, but generally applies to other disciplines as well. So I'm actually going to start with some past work. Uh, because at some level, we continue to face many of the same challenges. Right? As our resources scale, our problem sizes scale, uh, we end up revisiting some of these, some of these same issues uh, over and over again. So some years back, I worked closely with the ENZO team, uh, which uses a particle and cell grid-based grid. Uh, it's regular grid, uh, and so we were looking at a single variable, in this case density, uh, and we're looking at on the order of a quarter of a terabyte uh, of data per time step. Uh, for, um, for visualization plots. And of course, if you want to have smooth animations, uh, you need to make sure that you're dumping uh, time steps. Uh, and so, uh, especially if you're going to be doing uh, rendering post hoc, uh, and we definitely were in those days. Uh, so we use volume rendering uh, to show the density of, of dark matter. Uh, and because the, the data themselves and lives where the people are, uh, remote visualization is a necessity. Uh, and here we enabled the rendering and streaming uh, visualizations uh, over the wide area, in this case for Supercomputing 09 uh, in Portland. Uh, and this will become a recurring theme, but uh, as the data scales up, having more uh, real estate or pixels to show all of that data becomes increasingly important um, and useful, and hence the title display. Uh, this, of course, requires sufficient bandwidth uh, within the resource for doing the parallel uh, distributed rendering. Uh, as well as for over the wide area for delivering fixes. Uh, this again was all post hoc. Uh, the following year, we wanted to interactively explore our remote data. Uh, this time, there were multiple variables to explore. Uh, so we used the traditional side by side by side, you know, four up arrangement of volume, volume visualizations, uh, renderings, uh, with synchronized, synchronized views uh, between the four variables. Uh, this particular view. Uh, was a pre-rendered animation. Um, but again, we streamed visualizations over the wide area, this time to SC10 in New Orleans. Uh, and we added interactivity in order, to, in order to, to explore data interactively and um, get more insight from the data. Uh, as the scale of our resources increased, uh, it meant that problem sizes could increase. But it also meant that, that we could add additional physics. Uh, in this case, radiation was added. Uh, so we wanted to compare what's the effect uh, of this additional force on the gas that we're computing. Uh, so we wanted to be able to compare these two simulations and 
by comparing them side by side, just looking at the density as we see here, there's really no visible difference between the two simulations. What we're looking at now uh, is where we're showing the relative difference, or normalized difference, of the density field between these two simulations. So the colors here show whether the density is greater in the radiator region, that's where we found the color red, or the non-radiator, where it's yellow. And these differ on um, the orders of magnitude. Uh, and the blue regions uh, in, this, in the middle of the color scale is where there's no difference at all between these two simulations. Uh, we also applied this to, to move additional variables, in this case, the drive quantity, uh, which we calculated on the fly as we read the two data sets. From disk, we read the multiple variables, did this type of uh, drive quantity calculation, and then took the relative difference of those two variables. Around that same time, uh, I started working with the hack team on uh, visualization of their dark mirror particle simulations. Uh, at the time, we were using our stable long memory software, which supported regular grids, uh, so we rejected those particles onto the grid. Uh, which again helps us see very basic characteristics of overall behavior. Here we're seeing the evolution of the data from a single rank of simulation. Um, this is, of course, just a small fraction of the data. The full data set is about 60 times larger in each dimension. Uh, as I referenced earlier, you know, the more data that there is, trying to fit that all in a limited number of pixels on the screen results in throwing away data. And in some cases, a lot of data. So, Choosing appropriate subsets and zooming in and filtering um, become increasingly important for gaining insight. Uh, since we're calculating particles now rather than grids, uh, we wanted to start looking at the behavior of the individual particles. Uh, so we started rendering them as point points. One of the challenges, of course, is with increasing scale is how to render this increasing number of particles with very dense data volumes. Uh, and a limited number of pixels, you often end up with a brick. So selecting some regions and zooming in is often required uh, in order to see sufficient detail. Uh, but additionally, filtering. Right? So filtering particles also reduces the memory requirements and increases uh, rendering rates, which is obviously important when you're looking at uh, doing interactive exploration of data. Um, but doing that while still preserving salient structures is also important. Uh, being able to see individual particles, of course, reveals more detail. Uh, and as the science team has often told us, you know, we worked really hard to get all these particles in there. We really would like to actually see them. Uh, in more recent work, we combined several rendering techniques. So volume rendering of particle density. Uh, that show, helps show the overall structure, particle rendering instead of individual particles, subset of individual particles, uh, which gives us detail um, of particle behavior, halo formation. Uh, and here we have images, uh, image glyphs uh, to identify galaxies. Uh, here is some of our most recent work with the last training simulation. We use a similar combination of visualizations again, only rendering of, of density. Particle rendering of subset of dark matter particles. And here we just use spheres to represent halos. Um, they're scaled by the radius and colored by the mass of these halos. Here we're looking at the final step of the simulation, which is on the order of 31 terabytes for that one single uh, time step of data. Uh, and it's not practical, obviously, to store this at each time step. So typically, just data from a single rank is saved at every time step. Um, that's what's used for visualizing evolution. Um, and as these simulations scale even larger in the future, of course, doing a visualization and analysis in situ while still in memory um, becomes vital. Right? And that raises all kinds of questions like what data to save and how often. And right? we need to develop techniques uh, for helping us to determine um, what data is most important to save. Uh, also, if we're, if we're saving images, uh, where should we be pointing our camera so that we don't miss something meaningful? Right? And of course, there's much work uh, in the visualization community going on to uh, address many of these uh, issues. Of course, I'm going to talk about Exascale. I'll be remiss if I did not mention Aurora, which is our Exascale system slated for arrival in 2021. Uh, it's based on Intel processors as well as 
uh, the new Intel XC GPUs. Uh, it also has a new file system technology, distributed asynchronous object store for DAOs, uh, which is expected to have a bandwidth exceeding 25 uh, terabytes a second. Uh, but even with this increased bandwidth, uh, this issue is still going to be required. Now, I've talked uh, a bit about a lot of these things already, um, as we uh, say as we face at other scales. Uh, but this issue is an analysis of uh, really good necessity. We just can't save all the data that we compute. Um, so all of the challenges inherent with this issue that, that come along with it will be addressed. Um, there's also new technologies such as data. Uh, there are ways that, we, that this can be leveraged to address uh, some of the challenges that we do face. Uh, accelerators, of course, are not new, um, but they still bring challenges such as data movement. So, you know, can we perform compute and analysis and visualization all on the GPU without needing to move data back and forth? Right? Um, our software tools are going to need to address this. And from a facility standpoint, uh, the notion of resource allocation. Uh, as we perform more and more visualization and analysis in situ, we need to factor that time to our overall uh, resource costs. Uh, which is somewhat of a shift in mindset. You now we're, we're accustomed to trying to get the most computation we can uh, during our allotted time, and we'll worry about analysis and visualization later. Uh, but we really need to start thinking about that sooner uh, and plan for that at simulation time. Uh, and so with that, um, I would like to, to acknowledge our funding resources and say thanks for listening. Hello, this is Silvia Ritzi from Arden National Lab. We have one uh, question for Jesus. And the question is, uh, what metric do you use for comparison of different visualizations that were shown side by side? I'm interested in computing different volume renderings, comparing actually different volume renderings. Right, uh, so currently we're still running several tests to see where the, the best metrics. So there's two different uh, ways that we're doing this comparison. One, we've tried doing image-based comparisons, so just image versus image and doing a diff. That seemed to be a bit too chaotic because uh, the, the renderings themselves didn't match one-to-one. -one. And uh, because we're doing this conversion factor, uh, it, it's, it's been very difficult to do this image versus image diff uh, comparison. And, and second, uh, we've tried just doing the standard uh, cell-based comparisons. So because these are two uh, regular grid data set. So we've sort of unified them to a single a format to simplify this analysis. We, we've done several difference metrics and, and that's one way to visualize the difference. I didn't show them here uh, for, for this talk, but just doing, say like an absolute difference uh, and, and taking the log of that is, is one way uh, to do uh, comparisons. Uh, and, and we do have other uh, metrics like PSNR, MSC uh, that, that are more experimental but essentially just different space cell metrics. So another question came uh, and that is for Jesus again. And the question is how applicable are the VIS techniques to other simulations with more sophisticated galaxy formation physics treatment like Eagle or Illustris? Um, when you mention uh more sophisticated galaxy formations, uh, assuming that you're doing a similar uh, a similar method of doing this halo extraction. If you're doing a, a large scale versus large scale comparison of the entire uh, of the entire simulation space, that that becomes very difficult. Uh, it becomes a lot more manageable when you do smaller scale comparisons. Like I mentioned, we extract the top ten, the top twenty, the top n halo regions, 
and then we do region versus region just to make it a lot more manageable and that becomes a lot more difficult with with larger scale data so uh, a lot of this analysis being done is is specific to uh, halo versus halo region and a, a lot of this stuff should be applicable to that as well even if it's more sophisticated if, if you downsize the problem to specific regions of interest then that should make it a lot more uh, simpler to to perform if, if we have one second, I can make one other comment. So the very important thing here is that the simulations were run from the same initial conditions. So exactly the same structures form. So in principle, what um, what was asked can be done because actually the scales of those simulations is also not um, enormous, but they have to be run from the same initial conditions so that the same structures form so that you compare really apples and apples and not apples and oranges. So that, that's very important. All right. Thanks for the questions and thanks Jesus and Katrin. Um, so with that, we can move to our next talk and that is gonna be from uh, Anders Innerman. The title of the talk is Open Space Visualization. Very welcome to this presentation of Open Space, a very ambitious project to visualize the whole universe. I'm Anders Inneman, a professor of scientific visualization at Linköping University, and I also have lecturer Alexander Bock with me, who is going to pilot the demonstrations for us. The vision behind open space was really to try to browse the whole universe. And we started talking about this with our partners over at the American Museum of Natural History already back in the early 2000, 2001. We had the ambition to really contextualize scientific data from space missions, from observations, from simulations, and try to do that with high quality scalable graphics that would take us all the way from dome theaters down to laptops. We also wanted to have novel interaction. We wanted to have virtual reality. We wanted to have tablets, gesture, and even voice control for the system. One of the underpinning ideas behind the whole thing is what we have observed as the convergence of the paradigms of explanatory and exploratory visualization, that we can do both science communication and research using the same tools, the same data, the same visualizations to communicate science and also do research. But we also wanted this to be open source. Uh, and this is a very ambitious project, of course. Some of the challenges that we encountered very early on was the spatial and temporal scales that we have to deal with. Uh, we're ranging from centimeter scales all the way out to the end of the universe at 13.8 billion light years out. Also the variety and the size of the data coming from different sources, very large data sets, um, multiple terabytes of data that we had to handle. Another challenge dealt with the collaborative and the immersive aspect of visualization that we wanted to have high quality, high resolution, high frame rate graphics to support collaborative work. Another issue that you always encounter when you work with public spaces is of course, flexibility and robustness of your code. Anything that can break will break in these environments. Open space was set up as a project in 2015 and very soon thereafter, we managed to get funding from NASA, uh, very grateful for this. Also complementary funding from Swedish agencies, the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation, and also the Swedish eScience Research Center. The partners in the project is Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, we also have the American Museum of Natural History. We have the Ski Institute in Salt Lake City at the University of Utah and NYU in New York. And of course, the Visualization Center sorting on the Linköping University in the city of Norrköping. Open space is very much about the people. Uh, and here's a picture of the people who have so far contributed to the development of the software. It's a range of students that have been doing their master's projects within the context of the open space project. Also some professional programmers who are hired to harden the code. And also of course, the managerial team at the top and the scientific advisorship. Open space, if you look at the possibilities with the software, we have demonstrated is in, in a number of interesting missions and occasions. 
the New Horizons flyby of Pluto in 2015, we were actually there with open space and visualized in real time the trajectory as the spacecraft was flying by Pluto. We did, of course, not have the images because the, the time delay to transfer images back uh, to Earth. But we connected 11 different sites all over the world uh, to share the experience of being there with the scientists as they were flying by Pluto. We also have very high resolution imagery from Rosetta and the, the landing on the comet. An exciting thing that we have done is also to recreate the past in terms of going back and looking at the Apollo missions. Here's an image of the Apollo 8 as it's orbiting the moon and the famous moment in the history of mankind, the Earth rise, when humans for the first time see planet Earth rising over the horizon of another celestial body. What we would do now in this very short time in the spotlight is to show you three different use cases that are giving examples of the power of what open space can accomplish. The first one we look at is space weather simulation. And of course, our partners at Goddard Space Flight Center are doing simulation work on space weather and space plasma. Now, these simulations, they uh, come in multiple flavors. And there are many, many different models that are being run. And we will be looking at data from one of them momentarily. The challenge with this data is really to try to handle the spatial temporal scales. And we have designed a, a time space partitioning tree where we are looking at a binary search tree in the time dimension and an OCK tree in the spatial dimension. And as you can see down here, we are applying a very condensed uh, data structure to represent the both trees in time and in space and to dynamically be able to select the right level of detail at any given time during the simulation. Now we will have a demonstration, a live demonstration when Alex will be running open space and we will show you exactly what we can do with interesting space plasma simulations. We'll be looking at one particular corona mass ejection from the year 2000. So to start off with our first demo, we will be using data from the Community Coordinated Modeling Center at Goddard Space Flight Center. We will be looking at uh, the sun. And you can see here now, you have the whole solar system and we're gradually moving in towards the sun. What you also can see on the sun now is the magnetogram. And this magnetogram is actually used as the input for a simulation of the space plasma. The particular model that we will be looking at data from is called the MAS. It's a physics magneto hydrodynamics based code. It stands for MHD about a sphere. So I will ask Alex to turn on the data that we have picked. And we have picked one particular day. It's the 14th of July in the year 2000, where we have an, an event that's known as the Bastille Day event, a coronal mass ejection. Time is progressing and you can see how the field lines, the magnetic field lines are being shown up here. And eventually you will see the massive corona ejection coming out here. And you see how the field lines are going chaotic and you're getting magnetic recombination out here. You can also note that we are now freezing time and we are showing the direction of the field lines using the animation. So you can see the flow of the magnetic field as well as we are rotating around the sun here. And this is a beautiful, nice visualization of a massive coronal mass ejection. Another exciting aspect of open space that we are quite proud of is our ability to visualize planetary surfaces with high resolution. Uh, what we have done is that we have designed a system that we call the globe browsing system. We can have multiple repositories residing all over the world we have simultaneous layers that we can visualize. We use height maps. We even have spatial temporal images. Uh, and we also have a layered architecture behind this uh, idea. Uh, the heart of the globe browsing system is a software package called GDAL, um, where we do geographic map projection. We have a chunked level of detail render where we are using quad trees. And we use eight quadrants for the entire planet on the highest level. And we are progressively increasing resolution as we are getting closer to the planets. One of the very important aspects of the globe browsing system is the way that we are adjusting the rendering depending on how close to the planetary surface we are to avoid inaccuracies in the rendering. 
So we are doing model space rendering when we are far away, and we do camera space rendering when we're getting closer to the surface to avoid jittering that we would otherwise have on the planetary surface. Here are a few examples of high resolution images uh, of the planet Mars. Uh, and we will just in a little, little while show you an interactive flyby over Mars and land in the Grand Canyon or Mars, the Valles Marineris. For our demonstration of the globe browsing system, we have picked the planet Mars. You can see Mars in view now in open space, and we are showing it with the images that were taken by the Viking missions back in the 1970s already. What I'll ask Alex to do is just to uh, bring in data from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the MRO, where we have data with six meter resolution coming from the context camera, the CTX camera on the MRO. We will also be zooming in on, on the planet and Mars is of course a planet where we have very dramatic formations. We have the Mount Olympus, uh, 26 kilometers in altitude. Uh, but we are zooming in on the Valles Marineris, the sort of Grand Canyon on Mars. And we have very dramatic uh, formations here. We have thousands of meters of drops uh, along the edges of the Valles Marineris. We have decided to go into one particular part of the Valles Marineris called the Southwestern Candrocasma. Uh, we're flying over this mountain range and it will be coming up. You can see also on the left-hand side, there's one texture, uh, one image where we have slightly lower resolution because that was a sandstorm blowing while that was captured. The terrain here is then, of course, reconstructed using a stereo matching of image pairs. We are now coming in to a place where we have additional data, data coming from the high-rise instrument on the MRO, where we actually have resolution of about 25 centimeters. As we are flying in, we are bringing in more and more of the resolution. And you can see how the globe browsing system is retrieving data because the data is not really residing locally. We are uh, probing servers from all over the world to bring in the data. The sand formations that you can see are approximately 50 to 100 meters in altitude. And this is the Martian terrain at almost the human scale. You would see human dwellings, you would see cars, you would even see individual humans at this scale down here. And this is perhaps one of the powers of open space is to bring us to planetary surfaces, to places that are difficult to travel to or even impossible, even though, as we know, Elon Musk and SpaceX are planning to fly here within the near future. Another aspect of open space that we're very proud of is its increasing ability to also be used as a tool for astronomy research. We will show you this using data from the Gaia mission and the data release two from 2018, where we have more than 1 billion stars and quite a few of them with radial velocity information as well. The challenge here was really to maintain interactive speeds. And our trick to doing that is uh, an efficient data representation based on an octree. And the octree is really divided and the subdivision based on the occupancy, the maximum number of stars per node. On top of this, there is the other challenge. If we are rendering, as we are doing now in image space, we are rendering the stars and projecting them onto the curved geometry. Uh, really requires a little bit of extra effort to make sure that the stars are looking correct in these image projections. Here's an example of what it can look like. Uh, just a month after the data release, we had an event in New York. At the Hayden Planetarium, we have a number of astronomers viewing their data for the first time, being very excited about the possibility to simultaneously visualize the spacecraft and also looking at the one billion stars. And you can even see the granularity of the detectors inside of the data. We will now show you interactively a part of the Gaia data set. So for our third and final demonstration here, we are going to look at the Gaia data set. And we'll be starting off by having a nice view of our solar system. We will be gradually zooming out. So Alex, can you please start pulling us back? And the stars that you are now seeing in the background are the stars from the Hipparchos catalog, where we have 15,000 stars. We 
we'll be moving out to a distance of about a light year away from the sun. And at this point, Alex, let's turn on the Gaia data set. And now we are looking at the 7.2 million stars where we have the radial velocity as well. Uh, as I said before, we have, in total, we have about 1.3 billion stars. Um, but the most interesting ones are perhaps the ones with the radial velocity. So I will ask Alex now to turn on time stepping and we will be moving forwards in time actually 16,000 years per second. So, so keep an eye on what's happening to the stars as they are moving out. Now this is one of those interesting things that you can do looking at the stars as they are moving. And in fact, uh, some of our collaborators, the astronomers have using this feature already been able to observe novel things about the grouping of stars, how they're actually moving together in groups in previously unknown ways. So this is clear evidence that contextualizing scientific data, looking at massive data sets and playing them back in these environments can help and be a very useful tool in astronomy research. As you have seen in these demonstrations and the presentation, open space is quite versatile and can be used in many different situations. For instance, here you have a user on the left-hand side doing a presentation, perhaps in a planetarium or in a large screen environment. We also have the situation where you have builders that can easily assemble, for instance, data from a spacecraft mission or even the spacecraft itself. And of course, we have the developer mode where you really get access to the open source software and you can dig into the nitty gritty details of the programming and scripting behind open space. One of the tools that we are making heavily use of uh, is the dynamic way that we can display open space content using the simple graphics cluster toolkit, a toolkit that we have developed in house here. Uh, that really makes it possible to run on multiple computers, multiple screens, uh, and interact from a master node. It's quite easy to configure uh, and very dynamic. And as you can see, here's open space uh, running on a number of different platforms, ranging from uh, laptops to touch tables where we can do interactive uh, visualization of the planetary system. Um, here's in the dome theater flying over the Himalayas in high resolution. And of course, visualizing the spacecraft. And here's the fish eye uh, uh, view that we can use to broadcast, for instance, over YouTube. Of course, I really would have liked to have this presentation inside of our dome theater where you can see open space uh, running in full immersive 8K resolution across our dome theater. But that will have to be left for another time when you can visit us in the city of Norrköping in Sweden. Okay, so we have one question for Anders from Niklas. What are the most difficult aspects in open space to narrate visually and to understand and experience by user? Is visualization the only tool? What about using other modalities in the narration like sonification and then in bracket like, yeah, I'm an audio guy. Mm. Well, you know, I think what, what, one of the uh, most difficult things uh, in the standard narration tour of the universe is the actually the cosmological aspect, the four dimensional uh, structure of the universe. And since it's a, a, a sampled version using data observed from our point in space, as you're traveling out in this sort of non-physical way, uh, you're linking space and time in this sort of representation and explaining that notion to a general audience that they're actually looking at a three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional universe through the viewpoint of the earth is not so easy. So that's that's a difficult part of the narration. So um, uh, any kind of means that you can use to do that. And, uh, and I think that uh, sound sonification actually helps quite a bit in, in terms of providing that. And, uh, and I know that Niklas is an expert on that. So it would be interesting to explore more of that. But I think this notion of 4D space uh, as depicted through a 3D projection through our point is, is the most difficult part. Yeah. Okay, so does anyone have any questions for Anders? Because like, I have one question, like what is the most exciting visualization you've done? I 
in, in general? Uh, uh, in like in con in the context of in space, because I think like all the videos are very well liked by everyone. Yeah, but do you have like yeah. a favorite? I, I think that my my favorite moment is actually when you get that appreciation of uh, moving out into what you have perceived as a two-dimensional structure like the, the night sky and actually as you're pulling out and you're seeing that being resolved in 3D I think that's one of the most exciting moments that was a, a bit of one of those moments when I go wow yeah I know that this is the way it is but it looks like this uh, and you know for, for the future I mean some of the things that I've seen in this uh, a spotlight here, I'm dreaming of putting that kind of simulation data into open space as well and to contextualize that data because I do believe that contextualization of the data is very important for science communication that you get a feeling for it. But it's not only science communication, it's also for uh, researchers themselves to find the context of where we are, how, what scale am I at, where, what does it relate to in terms of other, other data sources. Uh, so I think this sort of the, the vision of browsing the universe and browsing the simulation data within that universe, I think is can be a very powerful tool in many different ways. So, but I'd, I'd love to have some of those capabilities that I've seen in the other presentations here, um, the uh, scalable ray tracing and integrate that into the tools that we use for science communication. I think that would be great. So this is one of the reasons why I'm so keen on this particular session here and the group of people around here. Okay. Um, Catherine, is there other things that you would like us to visualize as a cosmology expert? I still would like to see, so, so what I have um, shown in the talk mostly was a distribution of dark matter, but um, we also very briefly touched upon the connection between the galaxies and the dark matter. And um, just as Andres just said, like visualization is very often very useful to make um, people understand better what we are doing. And this um, formation of the galaxies inside the dark matter halo, that is something that, that we really would like to see a little bit more of, like the matching up of, of the galaxies and the halos, the dark matter, the, the connection between the galaxies and the dark matter, because it's so important to understand more how we do cosmology in general. Okay, so, so there is a question for the panel uh, from someone with Mubdi. Mubdi. So question for the panel, I know some of the speakers have shown things like phase plots and the like. Would anyone be, be willing to comment on the visualization and non-physical data? Often the quantities we care about in cosmology astrophysics are not things like position or luminosity, could a panel comment on their approach to this? Is anyone willing to take up that question? Okay, so we don't really... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean I, I've done a little bit of that work in, in, in previous life, looking at other other spaces, uh, phase space is obviously one of those in simulations that you want to look at, and and I think that providing that uh, even providing that support in terms of location in space uh, is important even for those kinds of simulations. And but of course it brings up a whole a whole other game in terms of visual representations and uh, what it is that you want, what kind of structures you're looking for. But uh, it, it's um, one one thing that I that I really would like to work more on is also to increase the, and I mentioned this yesterday in, in a presentation as well, and the, the notion of how you are actually combining space and time in terms of the trade-off in resolution. Uh, I think visualization has in many cases been focusing a lot on the spatial uh, level of detail and not so much on the temporal aspect of that and how the scales are being linked together that you basically have this footprint uh, the speed of light across your screen is some sort of footprint in terms of how you're connecting space and time. So making that in the visualization when you actually automatically connect the resolution time in time and space. But of course, that's something that is also uh, reflecting a lot on the possibilities to do data transfers and transfer your frames at the same rate as you want to have your frame rate going on the GPU is, is a challenge in those situations. But, but I think there, there's a lot of 
a gain, potential gain in doing in doing that analysis, careful analysis of what 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 are, at what level of detail do I find the physics of interest both in space and in time, and how do I resolve that most efficiently? Okay. And also like from another project, what like, so many of us are part of the exact scale ECP project. And in that project, we do try to do compression while still preserving analysis. So for that, mm. we use things like cinema databases to visualize like lime alpha forest for simulation like mix, which are basically non-physical quantities. So this is something that we do on another project related to the exact sky project as well. So we do visualize that and cinema uh, database that has been mentioned in the in the Discord chat quite often. This is something that we use a lot to visualize this. So uh, we also have uh, Joe and Aaron online uh, from our speakers. And uh, I'll, I would like to ask them if there's any final thoughts or any final remarks uh, from you know the people working on the trenches, right? So, so they are the practitioners here. Uh, getting the visualization done. So are, are there any uh, final remarks that, that, that you would like to uh, say? Yeah, Silvio, I can, um, can everyone hear me? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. I can uh, briefly talk about that and, uh, and kind of segue off of uh, the last question that was asked about um, if non-physical um, or maybe non-scientific visualization would uh, be of interest. Um, and what came to mind there is, yes, of course, you could do more informa information visualization techniques. Um, and, and that's not something that I personally have done a lot. But um, when I've worked with Joe and you and um, other folks in cosmology this in the past, some of the most interesting data sets that we got were multi-field data sets where you'd have matter, dark matter, gray radiation, and maybe other fields that you were able to compare and contrast and do um, multi-field vis at the same time. And that's something that we're starting to build capabilities into OpenBKL for uh, at Intel, uh, but that's still very much a research question and not so much a get it into production visualization question. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential interest there in not just looking at the, the raw 3D data itself, but looking at the transfer function space, the range space across these different variables and being able to make sense of that Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Joe, do you have any final remark? Um, not really. I mean, other than, you know, this has been a, a fun panel to be on. And, um, you know, it's exciting to see everybody else's work. Um, and, I mean, obviously, I work with a lot of you guys already. And so looking forward to, to continuing some of that. Thanks, Joe. So, yeah, I would like to thank all our speakers again, and uh, especially since uh, there's been a lot of pressure to put together videos well in advance of this. This this year has been challenging, and so we're all learning. Also, thanks to our, our tech support people, uh, there's, there's been a lot of work from them putting all together. So thanks, everyone. And, and I think that, uh, I, I don't know if, my colleagues have any, any final words, but we're, we're ready to close the session here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.